but you're only as good as your nurses because that's where the rubber hits the road as far as the education and the uh, swag into the uh, you know, meeting another individual with the concern that you're going to try to address. And with good nursing staff, what I'm completely blessed with uh, and support, it makes all the difference. So this is the front line. So you're just trying to gain more pertinent information and transitioning a, a good experience between you and somebody else meaning their urologic needs. Who here deal, deals with the, a number of or care for children in the urologic aspect? All right. And then and is, is the uh, this component of the program for you then for more just to know, or is it because of testing, or is it because just kind of get a feel for where you, where you want to go with this? Testing, yeah, yeah, you know, right, right. So some of the oncology and stuff in the back, that's what I anticipated. So, so seeing big pictures of tumors and stuff and how you can remove them, would be like, all right. Well, or is it like, yeah, I can, wanted to know that that's something important or should, should be aware of. And then, so, so I kind of broke this down into, instead of just looking at anatomical abnormalities of the urinary tract and cancers in particular, I thought, let's give a general uh, schematic about just general things you would see in pediatric urology or things that may come pertinent to somebody you would see or somebody that you would know or somebody you would be able to care information of. Because as a nurse, right, you're pulled by a family member or a distant cousin like, hey, you know, my child's having this, What's, what do we do? Is that a concern or not? Yeah, I'm sure you could have to feel those calls a lot. And so you can say, yeah, yeah, I, I know about that. And yeah, this is some things you can do. So hopefully be educational in those realms as well. Okay, so it's a potpourri of things. So just as an overview of things, so we can, you know, elaborate on some of these or move right through them and just try to, but at least um, infections are a pretty common thing that you'll get, uh, you'll see potentially if you're seeing a child or want to know about or have somebody ask you a question about. So I thought the important reflux dovetails in that dysfunctional voiding is very important because it's one of the more common things that can lead to urinary tract infections as well as the common hydrocele hernias and adhesions that we see on the descendant testes and the acute scrotum that everyone should be familiar with that's in this room. Uh, Penile abnormalities, hypospadias, or concealment, and varicoceles, and the obstructive uropathies will highlight that as well as far as corrections. So in management of urinary tract infections and reflux, there's specific guidelines that have been out there from a urologic aspect as well as the American, Pediat American Academy of Pediatrics. And as they went through their long list of detail as far as evaluation workup, uh, Riley Children's, which is down in Indianapolis, really kind of came up with a working method instead of looking at pages and pages of what's right and what's wrong and percentages. Like, well, so what's when the rubber hits and what can you really need to do? So when do you obtain a UA if you suspect a urinary tract infection? Sure. If it's positive, the urinalysis is positive, so just on a bag specimen, so they can just urinate into a bag if they're young or do the best they can to urinate in a cup if they're a little bit older. But if that urinalysis shows something abnormal, the nitrites are positive or white blood cells are present or red blood cells, then it would probably be prudent if you can to get a urinary culture. Now, if they've voided and you just send that collection off, I think that's not unreasonable. If you really have to know, then it may be best to get a catheterized specimen. So if it's been a plaguing or coming back or recurrence, you may want to really know, is it or is it not? And that's, a, that's a catheter specimen. That's not fun in a child because you have to plate some type of feeding tube, five French, eight French, to obtain that specimen. So we try to do the best we can in our office, and our nurses are great at this. Maybe just get the collected specimen. If the urinalysis is abnormal and this grows a single organism greater than 100,000, that's probably urinary tract infection. We treat accordingly. If you have to know specifically, because this has been a problem, is it an infection? Is it not an infection? I'm not sure. They've been treated for infection, but they've never had a documented infection. Maybe that's the time at least to get one catheterizable specimen. If a positive infection occurs, you, often, you typically want to treat for about seven to 10 days. All patients with a febrile infection, that's when the red should kick off. So it's infection and they have a fever. Then it's really a kidney infection. So bladder infections do not cause fever, kidney infections do. It's a pyretic response by the kidneys through the hypothalamus that's leading to a temperature. This is the driving force for the temperature in the hypothalamus. So it's kidney infections that send out the endotoxins that trigger off the hypothalamus that leads to the infection. So those really need to be evaluated because there might be something more involved. So all patients with febrile infections probably should undergo a BCUG test. Now this is Riley. Now there's different you know, comments about AUA and different comments about American Academy of Pediatrics. But if they have a febrile urinary tract infection, there's some potential for pathology there. And if they, if they have reflux that's present, VUR stands for reflux, then you may want to get a renal scan. But these renal scans are far and few in between because the radionuclide that they use is unavailable. So it's kind of a data now. So we're not getting too many scans anymore because the isotopes not around. 
If children are less than a year of age with febrile urinary infection, you, you may want to start that individual on continuous prophylactic antibiotics. That's a small dose, and we'll talk about a little bit more. But prophylaxis is important because if they're getting febrile infections, kidney infections, 20% of those who get a kidney infection will develop into a kidney scar. And 20% of scars end up leading to permanent renal vascular hypertension. So hypertension may be essential hypertension, which is the majority, but it can also be from a kidney injury, such as a scar, that sees itself as a portion of the kidney that's not getting enough blood flow. I don't get enough blood flow, I'm going to kick out this angiotensin renin system, which kicks up blood pressure. So that blood pressure increase can be a result of a uh, scar uh, as a result of an infection. So that's why we're trying to treat and take care of reflux. So we take care of reflux, we're preventing scar, we prevent scars, we hypertension. Uh, it rarely do you see, it used to be the fifth most common cause of patients undergoing dialysis is renal failure or secondary to kidney infections. But that's down, down now. So that's good because this has become more aware as far as reflux being treated. But prophylaxis uh, in, within less than a year because children in less than a year of age have a great propensity to develop a scar. So that's why you may even want to give prophylaxis for this patient. So what is reflux? So reflux is like GI reflux, is, you, know, you swallow something, it goes from your stomach, from the esophagus down in the stomach, and then goes back up, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux. Urinary reflux is urine in the bladder goes backwards up the ureter toward the kidney, so that's reflux. So it's grade one, just the ureter, two, all the way to the kidney, three, a little dilatation, four more, and five more. So anatomical abnormalities are present in 40% of the time that a child, when the child has a urinary tract infection. Flip that, 60% of the time they don't have any anatomical abnormalities. Hence, you know, you probably get an older sound, especially if they have a febrile urinary tract infection. And consider getting a BCOG because 95% of the abnormalities that are going to be detected are reflux. Reflux is not identified on a ultrasound study unless they have a dilated urine and dilated collecting system, then there's a potential that reflux may be present, but it doesn't mean it has to be. But reflux is the most common anatomical cause, making them vulnerable to, as well as identifying a risk factors for. Why do they get more urinary tract infections? Because they act like a yo-yo. So when the bladder contracts and empties out the urine, but if you have reflux, some's going out and some's going back up, right? So never get complete elimination. Our God-given ability to prevent urinary tract infections is complete elimination of urine in a timely fashion. So complete evacuation of urine is our main defense mechanism to prevent infections. If we're not completely emptying, and if you have reflux, you're sending some out and some's going back up. It's a good medium to grow as far as bacteria. Ah, swim around this area. Now, urine is typically sterile. It's not like, oh, we got a few bugs this week really bad when you get a lot of bugs. No, it's typically sterile, but if you're not completely eliminated, if you get bacteria present, it doubles every 45 minutes. And that's what can lead to overgrowth and to true infection cause. So when you have urinary tract infection, you want to look at the other things too, is, you know, is there a dysfunctional voiding component? Uh, how do we can prevent this? So when do we use prophylactic antibiotics? Is reflux present and when to correct? So dysfunctional voiding is really a characterization of incomplete relaxation of the pelvic floor muscles, which um, Kathy was talking about as far as the pelvic floor contraction relaxation techniques in the bulbal cavernosus muscle, even conducting emission or ejaculation purposes. So it's the same, it's the same congregation of the levator anti complex and musculature in, in the pelvis that can contract and relax. And the little bugaboos, when they learn how to urinate, they learn how to hold. And when they learn how to hold, they can learn how to do the dance. And they got this business cursing, they're doing this, you know. And mom's doing this too because she can't wait. So, so, so there's a, it's a cascade of things, but they, they, they learn this. And it's really cool that they can know, they can hold it, and they can not hold it. So, but it's, it's, it's a mal-learned behavior because then they, the more they hold, then bladder changes occur. So it's a bladder sphincter dysenergic response. So synergy is, um, so if this is the sphincter mechanism, so we always have a tone that keeps us dry. And so that, that tone is keeping us dry most of the time because there's a certain pressure as the bladder fills and stores urine, it's under a low pressure um, acquisition of collection of, of fluid. And this pressure, the only way you leak is if this pressure here is higher than this resting tone pressure here. That's the only way leakage occurs. So if you're sitting here or, or not passing urine, and that's because we have a certain tone and as the bladder fills, it gets to a certain volume and sends off the signal, you, you got to go. And you, you better get to the McDonald's or better go walk down the street or there's a restroom here and to the right because I know I've been there twice. Uh, so, 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 you, you, so you, you just have to know where to go. So, so if, as long as this pressure, again, is less than this, but if we're contracting because we need to go and this is contracting, you, you need to need a little more than your tone. So then you kick on those external sphincter muscles. So the external sphincter complex is not 
tone that's keeping you dry, but rather a gathering of the troops. It's like, whoa, we need a hole. And so you squeeze those. And that's, that's a skeletal muscle that, that the bulbocarium muscle is. This is not that. This is the external sphincter component where you can tighten. So you need to go and you just tighten there a little bit. And when you tighten, you shut that down and you then you know, don't leak because now you've increased this pressure more so that this pressure is not going to override that tone. It's a skeletal muscle, just like putting up your arms. You can do this for a while, but then these deltoids are going to fail after a while. And you go, oh, I can't hold that much more. So what do you do next? You compress. How do you compress? Well, you sit at the edge of your seat. You sit on your you compress your leg. You do this. So you're actually compressing the urethra then. That's an additional pressure. The bladder doesn't know. It just sees pressure. It's in the gym. So you've got to do a little bit, put more weight on the, you know, on the rack, you know, and just bench press a little bit more. So, so the bladder becomes stronger as a result of increased resistance. So you get stronger bladders, then its resting pressure is high, and the stronger bladder muscle wants to go more often. It wants to contract more frequently. And the more frequent it wants to go, then the more you have to tighten, and you get into a vicious cycle of tightening and squeezing and tightening and squeezing. And these little, little kiddos learn how to do this. And then they start having accidents and frequency and urgency. And they were dry, now they're wet. And why are they wet? And how are we going to get this change? And you've got to take the muscle out of the gym. You've got to take the bladder out of the gym. And so we've got to teach them to learn how to to go even before they need to go, right? Because anytime time they're holding, they're increasing that bladder pressure. And that's the same as adults, as, as kids, too. So, so you know, if we're, if we're trying to not have as much frequency urgency because of overactivity of the bladder, one of the things is to try to go even before you need to go, because you don't need this bladder that's, you know, overactive, which is up to 40 million people in the United States. That's a large quantity. Of people. That's more common than, than sinusitis or anything else. It's the most common, actually, uh, you probably may have heard all of that earlier in different talks, and you're already knowledgeable about that. But it, it may even be a thing that occurs in children that may manifest itself later. So let's get it when they're, when they're young. So dysfunctional avoiding is a dysfunctional elimination syndrome most often. So usually when they're having problems with urination, they may have a problem with defecation too. So we never not also discuss about the poops. And so, so they ask the question, so, so how is uh, little Johnny having bowel movements? Uh, they're going pretty good. They're going pretty good. Yeah. Um, does he have a one daily? So this is when he kind of can go. If the child's a little bit older, you go. Do you have a do you have a, a bowel movement, a fecal elimination, a poop every day? And they go, no. And, and mom goes, oh, you do. You, 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 you can go every day. No. Uh, you go every other day, every three days, every three days. So so sometimes they'll be unveiling like mom's embarrassed. And I say, no, no, this is good just to get out front. We just want to know. Mainly want to vote. And there's a Bristol defecation score, so you have to point to which one looks like theirs. Uh, does it look like a payday bar? Does it look like a baby root bar? Does it look like <laughs> Tussy Rolls? Does it look like milk duds or a soft banana is the right answer, you know. So you just but 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 you know they you know they so that's important the consistency because they because they know they they have a bowel movement every day yeah they're sending bricks you know they're they're cloggers and and, that, and that's the degree of constipation and you lose efficiency of emptying your bladder if you have constipation because it's it, it causes a rectal tissue to distend and that has a, a neurologic feedback to the bladder to not contract as well so urinary tract infections can be as a result of constipation not allowing the bladder to empty as well right that's our God given ability to completely eliminate in a timely fashion to lessen bacterial overgrowth and infections. So it is important, and it comes into play. So the first way to get urinary tract infections eradicated is really work with um, getting a good bowel program. So daily bowel movements of normal consistency, soft bananas. And so you've got this Buford bladder really arm wrestling with Sammy the sphincter. So and these guys are in cahoots, right? You know, squeezing and tightening, tightening, squeezing. And it's a wrestling match until, until you bring this out and break it down. So the time voting is very important. So. The, the Vincent curse we, we stated, it leads to the symptoms of the symptoms really the frequency, urgency, urgent constant, and the constipation, which we have to obey. This behavior modification is really effective. So, so getting this implemented is huge. It's trying to convince the parents this is the right thing to do. And mainly it's the confrontation of myself or my nurses to the little little guy, little gal, little dude, to um, go with mom with the program here. So this is a reinforcement because mom's already feeling beat up, like, oh shit. I'm not sure I've been working on this longer, and I should talk on. And so, so mom feels like she's pinned, like, oh shoot, I should have been giving them better things. They have bowel movements, and so we got to make mom feel better about this. So we're digging on the kids. You, you know, really got to do what your mom asks you to do. We're really trying to help you out here. So, if, you know, you, you, you know, you know. So when they ask you to go, you can't, you cannot say, I don't want to go, I don't need to go, I don't have to go. Okay, you just need to say, 
Sure, Mom. Thanks for reminding me. Sure, Dad. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. Just go in there and try to go. No, you probably don't need to go, but go ahead and do it anyway. You know, give, her, give Mommy a kiss or something, you know? So, so they, they need to be reinforced directly toward them that they have to participate. So they have to, you know, go, go with the program with Mom to help uh, eradicate this condition. Biofeedback is about 80% effective, but they have to be of age to be able to participate in the biofeedback phenomenon. So when we're doing uh, this evaluation, sometimes we'll do a flow, flow rate, uh, EMG, PVR. It's a very efficient, almost urodynamic evaluation of what's happening with the sphincter mechanism as well as what's happening with the bladder and the, and the ability to eliminate as far as infection risk. So you can place little stickers uh, on the anal area, not in the anus or in the, but on the, on the bottom, and that's going to uh, be able to assess if the sphincter's contracting at the same time the bladder's contracting. Now, a flow test can do that, too. Because Again, this is when people are there toilet train are able to manifest and try to do that urination. If they can do that in the office, they can actually urinate into the basin. You can see the actual flow rate. If you don't have an EMG to put little stickers on, at least the patterns would be, if it's a nice bell-shaped curve, that's a normal void. If it's kind of staccato, you know they're firing that sphincter at the same time they're firing their bladder. So that's when Buford and Sammy are arguing a little bit. So the... The, the biofeedback, if we had those stickers on there, and, and Renee is so good at this, and Kathy too, so they're able to help the child be not freaked out by these stickers. And then they get to play this game because they want to make this dolphin swim. And, and so the video, the, the, bio, the feedback on this, if they contract this and not contract this, then I'm able to know what to contract and relax. And by doing that, it will downregulate overactivity a majority of the time, and, and it usually takes us several sessions, but then you, you can play the piano with the teacher, right? But if you don't practice when you come back the next week or the next two weeks, it's like, okay, let's pick it up. Okay, let's go back to where we were that we, we were. You know, so, so this is something they can learn to implement once they learn what to do, because they can't take the little dolphin machine home, you know, but, but they can learn this, and, and we, you know, we kind of give them the green light. You know, we don't want to have them there every week or every other week, but they'll get this within a couple of sessions, so they're willing to comply. So they have to come back for a little re, re dash in the course. Uh, resolution of reflux can even occur. So let's say you have an antitopic abnormality, you have reflux identified, and that can even go away with a good biofeedback program, relaxing and decreasing that overactivity of the bladder which is gradually increasing if it's contracting against the resistance of the pelvic floor. So then in that of itself can reduce reflux. If reflux is dependent on pressure in the bladder, either exiting or going backwards up, reduce it. And mild reflux can even abate or resolve, or at least go down in severity. Uh, so it's working on all other ends uh, as well. So prevention things, cranberries and blueberries. A lot of people know cranberries. Uh, not a lot of people know blueberries, but I think it's getting around the blueberries are good too. These are the byproducts of these elements that are ingested. They're excreted in the urine that denude or take off the pili, which are on the ends of the E. coli, the most common urinary tract infection former, that doesn't allow them to adhere. So it's adherence of the bacteria that stick around and multiply to lead to the infection. If you take away their ability to adhere, which byproducts of cranberries and blueberries can, because those excreted products are in the urine, right? So the are either is this sweat, defecation, or urination as far as elimination of what we consume. So the byproducts of cranberries and blueberries are in that. Ocean Spray actually did the study way back when, because they're trying to figure out, well, is it acidity or, you know, what is it? It's actually the byproduct is broken down and eliminated in the urine. That's the big thing. So time voting, potty watch. Potty watch works, you know, that, that way the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the child can be empowered to, okay, it rings, so I can need to go take care of business. And we, you don't just do it at home, because they got to do it at school, because they're in school, so we got to send them, you know, uh, make sure that they have their sheet to go take to school so that, you know, as the teacher says, all right, no one leaves until after the class. You know, because they're too worried about kids running around outside and going to the bathroom. But, in digit class, so they, they, but if you've got a bladder problem, that, you know, you're trying to work at it at home, it's not going to resolve if they're spending, you know, a lot of the day in school. So they have to have a time program at school. And it's not just at the time, but also if they need to go, they shouldn't have to hold it until they need to go. So they, it's important that they go also uh, in the school hours as well. So we can send and encourage them to do that while they're at school. Uh, the four F's for, for bowel programs, fruits, fibers, fluids, and low saturated fats. And it's the pea fruits, peaches, pears, plums, prunes, and pineapples. You know, they have a lot of fiber in the fruits. So I think that's why they're most effective in facilitating uh, more improvement in the fecal elimination and biofeedback. Okay, antibody prophylaxis. So if they're in the three, in less than three-month period, you have to use the penicillins or cephalosporins because they, that's for 
uh, metabolism's sake, uh, so it's the safest for the child um, if, they're, if they're in the young months as far as what you would prophylact with. And when they're three months and older, they usually lean toward the nitroferantulins uh, or the septus or bactrim. Primsol is 100% uh, uh, trimethoprim, and it's probably the, the active ingredient in the antibiotic. The sulfas kind of go along with the ride. But um, it's going to be a little bit more uh, costly in Primsol than Sceptra, but Sceptra has, or sulfa-based medications have an allergic profile, right? You get the very big red blotches everywhere. And it, they're not necessarily allergic to trimethoprim, they're usually allergic to the sulfa agent, so that's what can be defaulted to. So VCUG, so, so VCUG is absolutely the most unfun test possible to undergo as well as to suggest to have done. And they fear it, and they come to see you, and it's like, we're doing everything but the VCUG, right? It, because it, it's just not good, right? You know, they have to place a catheter, put dye in the bladder, and they say, go ahead and urinate. Sure. You know, so it's uncomfortable and unpleasant, but when you need to know, if they're having recurring urinary tract infections with fever, you, you need to know. But there, I, I think when the child gets closer to, to two years of age, what do you do if you have reflux? Well, either you're waiting until you think it's, they're going to outgrow it, or uh, you, you can fix it, and so we'll kind of get to that too. So a position installation of contrast, or a PIC cystogram, is, is not unreasonable when children are a little bit older. So here, highlighting it again here, so a PIC cystogram. This was initially performed when they were realizing, oh, man, it sure seems like reflux. So they, they get these fevers, and this is when DMA scans are more available. So they get the scars of the upper pole and the lower pole of the kidney. That's where this reflex hits. And when they saw the scars and the you know, fevers and infection, and they did a VCUG and it didn't show reflux, like, dog, why didn't it? You know, so you repeat it again. So there's about a 15% chance it just won't show it. Um, so what do you do? Do you repeat the unfun test again? So this is when this uh, uh, type of performance of this test came in vogue, is that, well, maybe if we put them to sleep and put dye toward the ear, not in the ear, like a retrograde polygram, but toward it, maybe you can identify the reflux is present. So that's where it came in. And I kind of extended that to, why not just do that anyway? Because going to sleep and having it done doesn't have the, the horrors of, a, of what it occurred, how was it, and you know, how unpleasant was it that kind of sits with them, and mainly with the parents for an extended period of time. That doesn't mean everyone has to have it done that way, but if they're of age where if they have reflux and your consideration would be even to fix it, then maybe you can do a twofer. So if they're greater than two, they have no dysfunctional bone, they have recurring febrile infections, they may be a candidate for fix the reflux with deflux. Anybody here heard of deflux? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. So, so this is an easy way to correct with a high percentage of successful correction that can be done at the same time they're asleep when you confirm that reflux is present. So this is non essential non-cut therapy that can be used to treatment and perform at the same time. So if we look at the evolution of now kind of segueing into treatments for, for reflux, the most common anatomic abnormality for urinary tract infections, 95%. So we started out with surgery, and then we started getting a little slick. We got some injection therapies that were done in the 1980s, and we went to this laparoscopic, and, and then now robotics, so we're getting the slump again. It's going back to surgery. So surgery is not extinct, but it's an endangered species list, So because it's other therapy. So you've got the little, little kiddos not too excited about open surgery, nor the parents, and the little happy-go-lucky uh, little dude says, is there something less? So if you do this injection procedure, it's, it's usually a happy child, happy parent, so, because they can come out of this procedure, and they're pretty comfortable going home. It used to be a call they used to often get in the office. You know, they had procedures. They, is it okay if they go to a sleepover? If they really want to go, yeah, it's okay. You know, whatever they do is not going to interfere with what you did. It's like, hey, should they rest? You know, should they uh, play video games for two days? And, and no, you know, they can go do whatever they want to do, actually, the day after procedure, or even day of. So even, but, but robotics, you know, that's cool. You can correct this thing robotically. Yeah, well, this is one way of surgeons trying to take care of that fly on the wall. Yeah, you can put a bunch of port sites in. Or you just, you know, put a little spray can in there and take care of that same bug. So instead of, you know, do this real fancy, slick uh, um, robotic procedure, what about just putting a little injection into that? So there are better ways. And so uh, the reflex guidelines, you know, uh, prevent recurring infections. Uh, you know, prevent real injury, but minimal, uh, minimize morbidity and, uh, and, and help. So this is how it's done. This is a little bit of a picture. So by injecting deflux, we're injecting inside the ureter, and that's the, uh, the hit technique, uh, and then also injecting in front of the ureter. So it's a double bleb. It's inside as well as in front of. So schematically, that's, you see, and then in the pictures on, on the uh, lower left-hand corner, you see that they kind of have a, a circle there. So instead of a nice slit, so you, you know, I always say to the parents, so this is a wink, you know, the slit of the ureter, ureteric orifice is, is just a small slit. But in children who have reflux, the ureter is lateral and 
wider. So instead of having a slit, you have a, a, a true golf hole. And then, it, and, it is, and so as you distend the bladder and send fluid toward that orifice, instead of staying a slit, it balloons out. So that allows you to get into the ureter to inject. And, and the end result is you take something at rest, you hydro distend it, you see the hole, you start the injection in, inside the ureter, and then you inject in front of the ureter, and you get this little stadium effect at the far uh, right lower hand corner. So you start with uh, something you can putt into and you end into something you can never get a golf ball into, which I couldn't get a golf ball into, even the big one, easily, either. But this, this is what you're, what you're trying to gain. So visibly, this is what we're trying to achieve in that uh, injection. And it works, uh, uh, you know, pretty, pretty high percent. So the actual performance of getting from here to done is not a long pursuit, but they have to be asleep because it's very technically got a bit of strike to get that right response. Um, but... Um, so that's reflux. Anybody, any questions about that, or any, did we really hit that one kind of hard? And, okay, got it. So, so we're going to flip to some other pediatric urology things. So hydrocele with hernias. Uh, who here in the office, being in the urology field, is dealing with any hydrocele? Hydrocele is pretty common, right? And hernias, too. And yeah. So it's the same defect. It's the same abnormality. So, so, you know, so tell the parents. So, you know, when the liver develops, it stays where the liver. And when the heart develops, it stays where the lungs. The kidney goes for this major trip, right? So it develops near the, near the adrenal gland and then descends from the adrenal gland to the upper groin, upper groin to lower groin, lower groin to scrotum. That's, that's taking a trip. So Maine to California. So by doing that trip, as it goes through the groin, it pulls with it part of the intra-abdominal cavity. So the intra-abdominal cavity is like a box, right? And, and so as that testes descends through it, it's pulling like a hand through a balloon is never getting inside the balloon, but you're pulling that balloon with it. So as it goes to the internal ring, the external ring to the scrotum, it's pulling with it part of the abdominal lining. And that's what they call the patent processus vaginalis, or it's the hernia sac. When it's a, so it's a communicative component, and that's why a hernia, which is bowel or other in, integument, or, or fluid, which is a hydrocele, depends on how wide that aperture is of that communication. But it's the same communication. So whether it's hydrocele or hernia, it's really the same defect. Um, and the com communicating means there's, there's, so in hydrocele that often present as adults, that communication may be obliterated, but that potential space may refill with fluid just as a peritesticular fluid. So difference between communicating and not communicating. So in children, we see much more communicating, and that's why you often go for that type of repair through the groin to disconnect that communication. Or as, Hydrocells in the late adolescence or adults are typically not communicated unless they have a hernia. So that's why it's important not only to do an examination of the genitalia, but also feel in the groin and see do they have some fullness uh, in this location too, because still could be communicating. That would be the more typical hernia defect instead of a hydrocell. So when should we repair these guys? Well, they have a tension for spontaneous resolution up to a year of age. So you can come out with these really mother hydrocele. Like, Whoa, you know, like grandma scrotum down there. But, but these can still go away, so you don't get too urgent on fixing them, provided they're just fluid. Now, if they're hernias, it's a different ballgame, because especially in premature. So at the time of birth, about 1.5% um, of the population will have a hernia. At the time of one year of age, it's down to 0.5%. In premature infants, is 30%. So if they have prematurity, in other words, born less than 36 weeks uh, estimated gestational age, there's a, there's a pretty high percentage that they will have hernia hydrocele defects or patent processes. And in that patient population in particular, they're at risk for if you have a hernia and it can become incarcerated or it can also become strangulated. So you want to fix those, fix those earlier. So the strangulation risk. So this is obviously which is the side to correct, the left side or the right side? Not sure. So that would be a more of a hernia defect, right? Because you see the increase in swelling in the groin as well as in the scrotum. So glandular adhesions, labial adhesions, um, it's pretty common, you know, so on the, on the penis and the, and the little guys, so sometimes if there's a little extra skin or the redundancy, they may attach, and it's usually just a soft attachment, and it can be separated and pulled back, but it's very sensitive, and it wouldn't be something that you would just pull back in the office and go, okay, we did it. No, you, got, you turn one sort of happy guy into not a very happy guy at all. Uh, so, so you, if we always uh, will tell you, you know, come back and we will take down these adhesions with that very topical uh, and administration of Emla cream. So Emla is really nice and just set that on there, put a little tegaderm on there. You have them come back in about an hour, and it's a nice thing. Then you, you, you would take those down. No, often we'll just say identify the problem and have them come back in the next visit with the preparation that this is what you're going to do. We'll put this cream on, take the Tylenol, take the Motrin, see you, in a, see you in about an hour, and then you come back and then we can take those down. If they get a true bridge like this on the far 
right hand side as a fusion. So you can pull that till the cows come home, you, you know it's not going anywhere. You know, it's not working. So you have to cut that. So you have to get in there and um, get out the toolbox and get this little fine scissor and make a little snip. If it's a little one, good. If it's a long one, not so good. Because when you cut it, uh, sometimes, because if, if you put a little dissect underneath there, get, find that little bridge and, and squeeze it to make sure they don't wince. And if they don't wince, then you can put a clamp. And after the clamp, you put a little snip and you drop it. It's good if it's small, if it's broader and may bleed. And then you got to bring out the silver nitrate stick. That's not good. Yeah, it stings, makes it look all gray. Mom thinks you killed the penis. Um, and, and Dad's pissed off. So, so, so. <laughs> So, so we just try not, if we think it's going to be a pretty big deal, then we just say, we'll put them asleep and we'll get it corrected. So, and stay away from nitrate. But sometimes you have to use it because you thought it was small and it's really bigger than you thought. You can get away with it. 